my amazing guest today is Zoe Charlton. Zoe creates figure drawings, collages, installations, and animations that depict her subject's relationship to culturally loaded objects and landscapes. Charlton received her MFA degree from the University of Texas, Texas at Austin, woohoo, and participated in residencies at ArtSpace, McCall Center for Art and Innovation, UCross Foundation, the Skowhegan School of Painting, and the Patterson Residency at the Creative Alliance. Her work has been included in national and international exhibitions, including the Delaware Contemporary, the Harvey B. Gantt Center, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, Studio Museum of Harlem, Contemporary Art Museum in Texas, the Zaketa, am I saying that right? National Gallery of Art in Poland, and Haas and Fischer Gallery in Switzerland. She is a recipient of a Pollock Krasner grant and a Ruby's grant. Museum and collections include the Phillips Collection, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, Birmingham Museum of Art, and Studio Museum in Harlem. Charlton co-founded, uh, uh, it's disappeared for me, oh my gosh, I don't know what happened with my text up there, um, <laughs> the, the collective that you uh, founded, Zoe. Yeah, um, so I co-founded Syndicate, and that was from 2016 to 2022, and then I have co-founded a new collective called Kindred Creative Residence in Agroforest. Um, as of last year and the middle of last year, and we are based in, in Fletcher, Vermont. That is incredible. That is incredible. You also, I'm going to finish the very last piece right here. <laughs> Thank you so much for interjecting in there. I don't know why my ink went away there for some reason. Uh, from 2003 to 2022, uh, Zoe taught full-time at American University and received tenure in 2009. She served as chair of the Department of Art from 2015 to 2018 and was the first Black American tenured full professor in the department. That's a huge accomplishment. Thank you. Charlton is tenured full professor of art and director of graduate studies in the School of Art at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today, Zoe. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks for inviting me, Dimitri. It's great to see you. We've been talking back and forth, uh, you know, via text and, and online and email. So it's great to put a face to your name. And this is wonderful. And a voice. <laughs> yes, yes, you're right, right. Instead of just this uh, <laughs> text on a screen. I, I have been following your career for a while now and just been completely amazed by the work that you create, but also your role in the world. You know, I I'm especially love speaking to educators and full-time, you know, tenured professors on that who are really committing to the field of education um, and bringing up the next generations of artists. And then just to learn about your, your work with these collectives. Um, I think I actually want to kind of start talking about those collectives. I'm going to switch some things up right now. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, can you can you tell uh, can you tell us a little bit more about them? Um, you know, particularly the, your newest venture. Yeah, yeah. So Kindred Creative Residence and Agroforest um, is a collective of seven individuals, and uh, we are from across the United States, um, Texas, Texas, Connecticut, New York, Baltimore, DC. Um, it's it's pretty wonderful and we uh, have varied perspectives and so um, one person um, Ebony is a uh, is coach is head coach at Coppin State head tennis coach at Coppin State um, Josephine is the executive director of FAN um, Nina Buxenbaum is a faculty at um, CUNY at uh, at a university in New York at CUNY and um, Roberto is invested in the tradition of permaculture. Um, Diggs is um, a, a farmer and educator and activist. Um, and Brie is um, a, an athlete and entrepreneur and uh, adventurer. And, um, and then there's me. 
<laughs> so, so we uh, we got together uh, a couple of years ago, and we realized that we had uh, some overlapping uh, goals and interests and aspirations, and that is to and that is to um, think about liberation and think about that through farming, activism, arts, and education, and what that means for. Um, Black, Brown, Indigenous, um, BIPOC, disabled, and queer communities. And we really wanted to uh, support building a space collectively for that. And because we realized that sometimes it's the kind of space that you're in that can nurture um, uh, the aspirational and nurture uh, liberatory practices and solidarity practices. And so that was our, that's our goal. And we are wow. in our first full year of planning for it. We uh, hosted two events and we are working on, and then we closed down for this, for the winter because it is snowy and cold in Vermont right now. Yes. <laughs> in the late spring. Um, and we are working on a, uh, a program of, um, of residences and residencies and um, activities um, on the land. And so we are actually stewarding 66 acres of Abenaki, unceded Abenaki land in Fletcher, Vermont. And, um, and so it's really important for us to really think about what it means to be um, of this land, in this land, on this land. Uh, with goals of rematriation um, and what it means um, and and the and the um, and the challenges of pursuing that right um, especially in a country that has extracted so much and even those of us that are brown black indigenous um, and Alana are um, indirectly and sometimes directly a part of that extractive process sure. so we're really being uh, we're trying to be mindful and thoughtful about what that can look like for us as a collective. That is incredible. Um, you know, I, I'm also just, I'm really inspired by that. Well, we'll get to some, you know, showing some of your work for those, and, you know, in case there's anyone who has joined us who is not familiar with your work yet. Um, but, you know, I definitely noticed that nature and this sense of place are these reoccurring themes within your work and you know so, so i'm assuming that this is a way for you to activate you know the themes that you're bringing out within your visual art now you're actually putting into into actual practice um, through the work of the collective can you talk more about that and how this connects directly with your art practice yeah you know i, I used to say that a lot of the the board work or the collective work and the collaborations were the collaborations that are outside of my studio um, had nothing to do with what I do as an artist. But uh, in reality, there are uh, fringes and overlaps, you know, and and um, and it's quite wonderful to see that. So lately, uh, the last since about 2015, I've been making work about my grandmother's this land that my grandmother had. Um, mm -hmm. It's no longer in the family, but it really st struck me and still strikes me as um, unique that in the 40s, she started purchasing property in the panhandle of Florida, really, and it was really about liberation. It was about mm -hmm. autonomy, right? And, um, and I think that those are some of the same concerns that many people are having right now. It's definitely the concerns that um, kindred craft has um, and what it means to be autonomous. And so um, as I'm making this work that explores what I imagine that felt like for my grandmother, um, I actually don't have to imagine too far because I'm actually doing it. And, wow. um, and so, whereas in my practice, I'm using cutouts of landscapes I'm actually now in a landscape that is very fertile and thick and and unknown and um and familiar 
you know, mm -hmm. even though it's in a different part of the country. Um, and so those are some of the very sort of general ways that it relates to my practice. But I think in more specific ways that it relates is the way that this land and our bodies in this land tell stories. They tell mm. stories of desire. They tell stories of um, needing to uh, feel rooted, feel grounded and belong. And so uh, much of my work, especially this work around my grandmother is about those ideas. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I love that there's this activation of these themes and then also this activation of your your family history. Um, you know, I, I think when artists are working in these ways, then it even it makes the, the art even richer. Um, I want to go back. I want to take a, a, a quick step back just for a second. Um, we're both educators. I tend to work with younger folks, um, you know, than probably you're working with at the university level. When did you know that this, uh, that the art path was the correct path for you? And then if you can think about, you know, perhaps thinking about the, the earliest piece that you created that, you know, was really that that moment for you where you're like, okay, this is the right thing for me. I'm I'm an artist for me. <laughs> I did not know that art was the right path for me. Um, so I uh, I when I graduated from high school, and it's so interesting that I was telling um, a friend Jade Rogers, who is founder of um, of the House of Afros, Capes and Curls oh, yeah. in Omaha, Nebraska, right? Isn't that awesome? I love that name. Um, <laughs> and she is doing, she is an archivist and she's um, embarking on a series of oral histories. And she was asking me some questions about that. And I thought, this was not in my plan. I did not have a plan. I did not know. You know, I'm a military dependent. Um, I had always loved to draw and I loved figure drawing. Um, didn't understand that that might be a viable way to, um, or an entry into a career path, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I decided to go to grad school, um, I still didn't have an idea. I didn't attend grad school to teach, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, that was the farthest from my mind, but I had a mentor, um, Michael Ray Charles, who, who is now at the University of Texas at Austin who said to me, uh, and on one of my last days working for him, he said, you know, I think you really should consider academia because, because of the things that you like to talk about and your commitment to making, to being a maker, it's kind of might be the only job <laughs> for you. Good and, for him. Uh, you did for him. I, you know, and I thought that that was really insightful and it was also really generous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I think, Along with that story, I have to um, talk about uh, my uh, my mentors. You know, my mom was an educator, and she wow. taught um, uh, primary and second. Uh, she taught elementary and high through elementary and high school, and she worked specifically with Down syndrome and autistic children. And um, and one of the reasons why she went into education is when she was going to school during segregation, she saw that many black children were being placed in special education classes um, and not necessarily because of uh, a need but mm -hmm. because of racism and so she wanted to shift that and she also had a perspective that uh, folks who were who are neurodivergent or who have various mobility challenges or concerns um, should not be separated from others. I love um, that. Because that helps them. And it also helps uh, people who are considered able-bodied. You know, sure. Well. And, um, and uh, so she went into education as a politic, right? It was her politic. And so when I think about things like that, I think uh, about what I may have to say and may have to contribute and I think about the things that Michael Ray said to me and I think about the kinds of people that I studied under and mm -hmm. um, as an undergrad I had one black professor and that was the late Ed Love and um, he was so um, 
influential uh, in the way that I think and the way that I uh, make um, and the way I think about materials that it seemed um, it seemed like a really good idea for me to enter this field because of all those reasons. Um, I really wanted to learn from people that looked like me, which is what brought me to UT Austin. And um, and then I wanted to contribute to um, the field in that way um, because I know I know I was I'm all too familiar with my own experience of not being reflected in um, in academic spaces. So uh, that's what that moved me into academia, but it wasn't my intention. I still don't know what that would have been. <laughs> so, you know, I'm so glad to be here. Um, so, uh, but you asked another question. I yeah, think, I, um, yeah. The, the, the part, the path of being a visual artist and, you know, when can you remember that moment or can you remember that one piece or project that you were working on that kind of set that spark off for you? Um, I think it was... I was actually in grad school and I had a transformative experience that, um, you know, I was making work the entire time in grad school and in undergrad, but there was uh, a couple of things that happened in grad school that said, this is actually wow. the thing. And it was um, late in the game. It was probably my second year uh, into my, my uh, final semester. It was a three-year program. And I was making these paintings and, um, and you know, I was plugging through them, trying to like figure out oil painting and acrylic painting and all of this. And, but I was making these drawings, these sketches on tracing paper. And, um, and one of my uh, professors walked in and then walked out. And I, I <laughs> paused and then, um, and then I saw that same professor um, at a bank. And as we were in line, he turned around and said, oh yeah, you're that painter. You know, wow. I think, well, it wasn't that, it wasn't flattering. So in the <laughs> middle of the bank, he said, and I'll tell you who it was, but uh, he said, hey, you're that painter. Paintings are okay, but you're a much better drawer. Mm. And you should probably think about drawing. And, you know, in my resistance, to him, I was like, no, I'm gonna paint. And when I went back to the studio, he was actually right. I was actually more invested in drawing. And, um, and the, uh, of course the immediacy of that, but about how it was a real record to the way that I was thinking, all the edits and smudges and all of those things as I was working through these um, significant ideas for me at that time. And then, um, and that was Peter Saul. And then wow. my Corey Charles came in. I know it was so mean. It was mean. So if he ever sees this, I hope he. <laughs> I hope he's like, oh, no, but I thank him for it. Um, and Michael Ray Charles said to me um, at the beginning of my third year, he was like, "Well, if you're not that invested in painting, just don't paint." And I scrapped my entire thesis show and started down another path. And it, wow. was such, it was such a wonderful experience. And that decision was supported by Lillian Garcia Roig, which was another artist that I worked with. And, um, and she's now at Florida State University, which is my other alma mater. Mm. And, um, and, you know, I was so uh, impressed with the way um, she moved through these really complex ideas about and how to represent them um, in a singular way. And I thought, well, can't I do that too in the way that I'm drawing and the sketches that I'm making? And, um, and so that was really exciting. So it was that show, that thesis show that put me on a path um, to making the kind of work that I do. And then, um, and then a few years later, I attended Skowhegan School of Painting and um, Sculpture in Skowhegan, Maine, and one of the one of the uh, visiting artists, Whitfield Lavelle, also wow. just gave me mad permission to do what have you. And and it's really interesting now. I mean, I just turned fifty, and I 
And I think about why does anybody need to give anyone permission to do that? But I think when you are emerging or when you're young and you um, don't have a lot of experience, you, Mm -hmm. um, you're looking for someone to affirm those kinds of decisions for you. And I think that those folks that I just named, um, and there are more people like that, but they affirmed um, this fledgling idea of who I thought that I could be and what I thought that I could make. And so I wanted to be a part of that history for myself and for other people as well. So, yeah. That like is that. A, yeah, no, that, and I think that's also incredible. I mean, you know, working in a museum, working, you know, with folks who are, who are emerging artists, um, and then even being in the academy myself, you know, I think we're taught that painting is the highest form of art. And so there's, you know, you, you kind of feel like if you're not, you know, mastering painting, or if that's not your thing, then maybe art is not the right career for you. Um, you know, because, you know, blue chip art <laughs> is, is painting, right? And I, and I just love that you've, you know, you were given that advice and then you also carved out your own unique path that I'm sure is influencing, you know, other up and coming artists of like, oh, I can do that as well. Um, With that being said though, because time just always flies on this program. um, I want to start showing, you know, some of these images. So just give me a second to share my screen and we're going to, we're going to dive directly into the work. Uh, just one second, see if I can get this happening fast. <laughs> um, and I'm going to turn off my closed captions. Sorry about that. Um, though, for folks, if you want to, if you need closed captioning, you can still do that on your own screen. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that that is a possibility. Um, but Zoe, thank you so much for sending me work. And um, I want to get into talking about the specifics of these pieces. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um. Oh, so, sorry. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. And I did. I did throw in another image towards the end of this, where where we looked at the sculpture of the house because that one um, and the house turned upside down. Oh, right. Um, yeah. In particular. So, you, you know, know I know that that's a recurring theme. <laughs> no, it's great. No, it's great. I, I always, I, I never know what I, what to send. It's so right. You know, I always think there's, it's got to be cohesive and then there's something missing. <laughs> so I'm so happy that you added that one at the end. This one is called in climate and culture. And I, it's only a few years old. It's one of the first pieces that I made without a body in it. And I was really mm-hmm. excited to do this. This is currently, um, how, residing on loan in the um, in the residence of um, Ambassador Gilcrest, who is the U.S. ambassador to Lithuania, and mm. uh, and I made this because I um, well, so he has uh, an exhibition um, in his residence that is um, that includes Florida-based and Florida-adjacent artists, um, and he's a Floridian himself, and so it was really exciting to. Um, to make this piece um, and and have it, you know, there, but it, it is about this fertile, wet landscape that's growing out of the belly of this home, and this is um, uh, a symbol that represents my grandmother's home. It was this kind of ubiquitous blue clapperboard house, baby blue clapperboard house, you know, in the Panhandle of Florida, and in the country. At the time, and um, and I wanted to make a work that was um, constructed fully of collaged materials and um, a single drawn element. And when I make, when I typically make these drawings that have collage elements, it's always the drawn and painted body with the collage foliage and and objects that come out of it. And so uh, the house is a stand-in for a body in this mm. one and it's about I, I, six inches tall about 50 inches wide wow so it's huge <laughs> yeah yeah m- much much larger than um than you know than what we're seeing on the screen um I'm just always I'm really curious about you know this 
we don't have the images of today and I were looking at your work earlier and kind of talking about it. Um, the, the figures that are carrying backpacks that have nature coming out of them. Um, and you know, now you're saying that the house is a stand in for the body and it's also a container for this nature that's spilling out of it. Um, I, I would love for you to talk more about this 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 idea of this this nature spilling out and um, these these natural elements and and things that may be in proximity to the structure or the body, but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So part of the way that I remember um, is um, and an environment that's very romantic to me, um, or that sits in a, a kind of space of romance for me is this um, landscape, is this like wooded landscape. And um, it's pretty, it is, a, it's a strange thing because I don't know that I have a particular romance around the individuals, and then just the land, but really is the individuals in this land. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about my family, and especially my grandmother, she is so intimately connected to that land. She sharecropped the land. She grew, um, and even after she stopped sharecropping, um, she grew her own food. And I just remember her in that space, in, in that house. And the, the land, <laughs> the landscape and nature was coming into the house like crickets oh, wow. you know there may have been frogs and there are all sorts of bugs and things like that and so um the only barrier between the landscape and what was happening in the interior of her house was just like the door and the mm. walls but the windows were always open the screen door opened and closed all of those things and so uh, she is definitely, um, my memory of her is not separate from the space that she inhabited it, inhabited it. Ugh, I can't say that word yeah, right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why, and I think about um, the things that, the ideas and the histories that we carry and um, some of those ideas that we carry are places, memories of places. And so they end up, um, sitting on folks' shoulders or um, objects get strapped to their bodies, their backs, their heads, um, their, their abdomens, et cetera. Um, because we do, we carry that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes it feels like we're physically hauling those things around or carrying them around tenderly, et cetera. So, yeah. Yeah, I I, I want to talk more about the 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 house being flipped over. You know, for me, it it, it immediately thinks about it makes me think about you know um, the idea of dispossession. You know, um, and I'll just throw in you know I, my family is from Louisiana, and you know these stories have been passed along um, for generations about this land that we had in Louisiana, where all of the family members were were living on the land, and at some point a fence was erected around the land and, you know, out of fear of losing their lives in the South, yeah. um, you yeah. know, family members were dispossessed of the land. And so seeing the house flipped over and filled kind of makes me think of that is, is that, I don't know if you want to go into personal family stories or anything like that, but, you know, was it, was it a decision for the family to let the land go or was it taken? No, it was a decision for the family to let the, let it go. Um, mm -hmm. When my grandmother passed away, her children made the decision to sell the property. Uh, they had all pretty much moved away mm -hmm. or moved on to their own spaces. And, um, and you know, that was uh, bittersweet, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, because this, this house was a kind of meeting house and safe haven for many folks, you know, many um, multiple generations of my family lived in that home for one reason or another mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um so it, you know it is it's it's uh kind of mythic you know for me um right and that's it right isn't that how we we uh build myths right sure we take the thing and 
we turn it into something else. And, um, and so, yeah, so that decision to, to, to let it go was really, um, is interesting. It's interesting for me. I, I'm a homeowner, um, but I don't know, I don't own land, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. You know? And so land like that, which is, mm-hmm. which is a really interesting thing. And, and it's also really, um, curious to me because both sides of my family, um, owned property and made decisions to let it go when they decided to move away. Okay. Right. Um, uh, you know, in part because of upkeep to, ex- you know, their just immediate family expenses that needed mm-hmm. to be resolved in that half and selling the land helped that. But, um, but I think about the, um, what my family and, and maybe other people um, that come from backgrounds like me um, think about legacy and, yeah, yeah. and, you know, wealth in the, that way, wealth attached to land um, is not always there. It's not always supported. It's not always valued. And so, so it's interesting to think about what that means. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I just think there's just so much, I, I, obviously there's, there's so much, you know, embedded in all of your work. Um, and these, 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 especially being at Museum of the African Diaspora, we've, um, you know, done some projects with the youth around, you know, these, these Sanufo masks. Um, so yeah, I would love to, to hear more about, you know, about this. Um, they're spilling yeah. out of this body. <laughs> You know, so they're they're spilling off the body, but they're also um, leaping towards this mm. body. Um, and so this is one of the few that um, has a, a kind of reverse relationship between the area that's drawn and painted versus the area that's collaged. And this uh, whole series is called the Compromise Series, and all the titles are based on the uh, the speech by. Um, the speech by Douglas about the fourth, you know, for the fourth of July, what to the slave is the oh yeah. July. And so this one is called um, Hopefully Looking for Life, which is a phrase, a section of a sentence um, of that piece. And so what they're all doing is leaping towards this woman's breast, breasts. And it's a woman who has had many children. My grandmother mm. had um, in total 11 children, 11 births, and nine who grew to adulthood and um and so the um all of these different kinds of people different cultures are all leaping towards um uh the body of a black woman for nurture for sustenance for need um uh and and so i really wanted to talk about that what does it mean when you um have a matriarch or are a matriarch or are a carer right in your community. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have that kind of history or experience, but I know many people that do. And so, um, it always looks like this to me, it seems like Mm. this. Um, and it's, uh, it's neither, um, I'm not making any kinds of decisions about it, but just the reality of what that is. And, um, and so this piece has uh, a lot of significance for me. Although I will say that this iteration of this piece is the one that I absolutely love. Uh, there are mm. other iterations where the way that these masks leap towards the body are either more curved or spread mm. uh, more. Um, but this is the, the one that I um, absolutely love. And it's funny because I'm I'm looking at this now and I'm actually looking at the masks that are on the table oh, wow. out, uh, because I actually want to alter the way that this sits in space so that it's actually wider but yeah oh my gosh that's incredible I mean I thank you for kind of going into that a little bit I'm really one of the things that I just find really fascinating about the way that you work also is um the fact that you know we can see in this image and we'll probably see in another one um, and the next one, how there is, I, I, I noticed that there's, there's generally, you have a, a solid piece of paper and then 
the work spills out onto the walls. Um, and and, and I, I think that's, it's just absolutely gorgeous for one thing. It expands the space um, and takes us beyond just, you know, thinking about the work within the, you know, the two dimensional constraints of the paper. Um, but I also wondered like, do, does the work change, you know, every time it's installed and, and do, do they- yeah, so, so they're, they're basically site specific every time. Every time, you know, in, in this one, this is called um, Her Yet Unwoven Garment. And all of them have a central piece, like you just said, there's the piece that's anchored onto the paper. And you can even see the square part of the paper where the body is. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the paper is cut around so that it allows this other kind of spillage or explosion to happen. and. Um, and that's pretty exciting for me. I was looking for ways for the um, for these larger pieces to function in the way that um, the sketches do. Um, and so usually the paper is larger so that kind of edges of the paper disappear in my periphery and um, or they disappear into the wall because it's on tracing paper, et cetera. And I was really thinking about how to do that, how to sort of remove this edge. Um, but that that central piece is a unit is a singular unit mm -hmm. and usually it's usually no more than about 60 maybe 65 inches tall and then about um and then anywhere between like 40 and 50 inches wide but it's all the other parts of it that make it look bigger right so and this one all of the the cluster of birds mm -hmm. are are units unto themselves and then there are single pieces that kind of work their way out like the falling leaves or the feathers and things like that. Yeah. And it oh also makes it, it's also a very practical decision um, because otherwise these have to all be shipped flat. And yeah, I have yeah. one that is huge and I did not build it as a puzzle. And that is a beast to even <laughs> move and um and to store and it mm -hmm. has to be stored flat. And you know, when these pieces are rolled, you know, there it's just not safe to roll them. Yeah, yeah. Delicate. Oh my gosh, I love that you just shared kind of the practical aspect of how you're constructing the pieces and you know, thinking about the shows. Um that that's that part <laughs> is just amazing. I would have even thought about that. Um, I want to know a little bit more about your your figures. Um, I understand you work with live models. I do. I do. I work with people. <laughs> I work with yeah, people. Yeah. And I tend to work with people long term too. Um, so there is one person, um, Desi Stewart, who I've worked on and off with um, for the last 14, 15 years. Wow. Um, you know, and he is uh, an amazing person, musician, writer, uh, deep thinker. And, you know, I think he's fantastic. Um, but I but I work both with um, with people in the studio and also um, photographs, photographic mm -hmm. references, um, and they're typically mine. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's you know that fantastic website, Artist Anatomy for you know an human yeah. anatomy for artists. I love it, right? Um, and um, you know a lot of clip art images, et cetera, of of bodies. But I'm typically working with people, and if I see someone. Um, that you know i think think their body may lend itself to uh expanding a narrative or complicating a narrative i'll ask them to pose for me and in the case of this series all the women are larger women and they're all found images online from online mm -hmm. and i was looking for uh, images of larger women that look like the women in my family right, that had weight on them, right, that had weight on them, that had bodies that were lived in, bodies that made other bodies, you know, and yes, so yes. That, was, that was really important for this series, and um, I, I had someone say, well, these are really unattractive bodies. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, isn't that, that's icky, right, right? Yeah, um, and, you know, by the standards. Talk, right, we can, right, we can talk about all of that, um, but it was really important that these bodies were, are represented or I've represented them and they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful mm -hmm. and full, right? Um, and, um, 
and that lived experience is a sign of wealth to me. And so, yeah. I love that. And, and, and I understand that you, you explore the various tones of black bodies also. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are those are critical things, you know, not just for representation, but also just the the personal connection that that you also have um, yeah. with the, with these bodies. Definitely, definitely. Um, this is uh, one of the first ones in that whole series, and it's called a country, the country, a country, the wilderness unsubdued. Wait, the country, a wilderness unsubdued, and um, and. This, since it was the first one, this is actually um, in the collection of the Phillips collection. And I learned a lot from making this one. Um, it was interesting. Um, the development of this piece happened at a residency, um, the McCall Center for Art and Innovation. And it was one of those residencies that really supported research, that really really supported kind of fits and starts and and failures, and it was it came at Excellent. the best time for me. And um, and the the um, the artistic director at the time was Nicole Caruth, who um, is a staunch you know Nicole yes yes right? <laughs> um, staunch supporter of artists, um, a real advocator uh, advocate of artists, um, and um, who you know just let everybody know this is what you need it to be right. And um, and I struggled with how to do, how to make this, right? How to make these pieces work together, how to build this in a way that I could actually transport it in my, you know, tiny hatchback. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which did not, just didn't work. I ended up having to rent a van to bring everything. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but that all the green is one large unit and that's probably about 70 plus inches tall. Wow. Um, and probably about 55, 60 inches wide. And then that thicket of birds that's coming out of the, of the tree line is actually attached to that main body. And then mm. the are separate. And then there are um, probably about five other clusters, four or five other clusters of birds that go across the wall. So oh, okay. That we're not even seeing, huh? We're not even seeing. Wow. This was really exciting to, to do because it answered a lot of questions. It also, and you know, in real practical ways, a lot of my drawings up until this point had, um, the larger drawings had, were graphite drawings on paper with mm -hmm. um, small elements of color that were painted and they look very flat or maybe they were rendered, but they always look like they were stuck on. And a lot of that had to do with the influence of the way that I was sketching, right? So I was using stickers or cutouts to as placeholders in those Got small it. drawings. And so then I would render them in those exact same ways. Um, and so, you know, I had been thinking about, well, what does this look like if I start using more and more color, right? Um, you know, just the those those things that seem like very simple uh, challenges in the studio, right? How do I use color, or how sure, do I use sure. color, right? How do I put these different kinds of images together that have uh, different visual languages together, and how does this work? And so I was working all of those things out uh, in in this work, on you know, at the same time that I was working through this content and this subject matter. So. Yeah, this is the first oh one. Oh my gosh, I love that. I'm going to I'm going to ask a question by one of our participants. Uh excuse me if I get the the name wrong, QB Red. Um so the question is your consideration for and use of space both aesthetically and how your art functions in the space are powerful. I agree. Can you please speak to how you use space? Your use of space relates to the content and concepts of your work. So I love yeah. that. That's that a question. great question. Hi, Kubi. How are you doing tonight? Um, I always think about where these bodies are going to emerge, like what are they coming out of? And often it's a nondescript space. It's the white page. And um, the white page is like the white space that's around me. Um, mm. It is a space that needs to be filled or addressed in some way or named in some way. 
and these objects and images and bodies that are on these white pages or in white, these white spaces um, are occupying or claiming this space. And so I think less about the environment as um, a place that needs to be uh, tamed or controlled but a space that needs to be occupied by mm. bodies and their objects or their their environments that actually need to be in it, right? And they need to be in it in a way that makes them unmistakably important. And so um, it's one of the reasons why there's so much white space around a lot of the things that I draw, the bodies that I draw and the um, the figures that I collage. So yeah, I love that question. Yeah, that is really great. I want to think about also uh, for you, how do you, how do you go about conceiving uh, your pieces? Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, how, how, how do you, how do you go about the conception? Like is, is the concept, you know, you were talking about sketching it, sketching it out. So do you first sketch everything out and then execute it in a larger scale or, mm -hmm. you know, this right now now we're working into three dimensions even further which i love yeah. <laughs> yeah i um i work i sketch i i am uh, a dedicated sketcher and i um i don't keep a sketchbook but i have a whole bunch of different size papers with ideas on it um and so i work out my ideas in that way i might have um i might be trying trying to tell a story and I think about the kind of body that needs to be in that story. And so I usually start with a figure and then I build around that in the same way that, um, and I always place like the body central to the narrative, even when mm -hmm. the body is not evident in the piece. Um, and so I try a bunch of different things to see how much the relationship between that body and that environment or that object actually spark um, that kind of play to want mm. to tell a story. And, uh, you know, in the case of this piece, this is one of the newest pieces. It's called Permanent Change of Station. It is um, in a show called A Movement in Every Direction, Legacies of the Great Migration that was curated by uh, Jessica Bell Brown at the Baltimore Museum of Art and Ryan Dennis. Um, from the uh, Mississippi Museum of Art. They co-curated the show and there are 12 artists in this exhibition um, that started out in, at, in Jackson, Mississippi and is wow. now at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And on March the 3rd, it'll be at the Brooklyn Museum. So those of y'all that are in New York, please uh, come meet me there. Um, oh, nice. This, this piece, uh, it took me, it took about a year, a year to, um, do the research and then the work and wow. um, and probably about a full nine eight nine months to make it and this is one of those examples I and I always have to say this about this piece before I get into the content this is an example of many hands realizing this work right um and that's really important to know mm -hmm. and um and for those of you that are interested in knowing, I will gladly give the long list of names behind this. Um, and um, folks are just very generous. But one of the things that this piece really emphasizes that what it what it means to um, think more deeply about the work that you're doing and, and that I'm doing and that um, I have to question why I was representing uh, spaces and mm -hmm. ob objects and people in the ways that I was and how that could or could not lend uh, more agency to the story that I'm telling. And so, um, and also it made me think about um, areas of research that I uh, wanted to move into um, specifically around this work. And so I connected in, uh, with Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, who is the executive director of Three Walls in Chicago, um, because her area of expertise is uh, Black folks in the military, is Black uh. military. And so um, 
And since this piece is about uh, my family's experience in the military, um, it was it was imperative that um, I work with her, and we um, worked together for eight straight months, met twice a month, to really work through um, the ideas and the images and. And I had multiple conversations with the curators of the exhibition, and and those were um, extremely helpful. And what I'm talking about is um, what it means to have a research partner, right? Mm -hmm. And someone that holds you accountable to the things that you think about and the things that you say, and um, and um, how deeply you're thinking about your ideas. And so. Um, and for that, I am greatly appreciative of the time, the space that Dr. Hayes um, shared with me uh, in the creation of this work. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so this piece, the drawing is 18 feet wide and about wow. 80, about 75, 80 inches tall. Um, the platform is 10 feet by 16 feet by probably about five feet high. I, and it functions as a pop-up book and uh, uh, that's that's really exciting and um and uh there the there are 10 panels of uh, rows of landscape and they represent the um 10 10 of the children that my grandmother had oh my one goodness panel is empty which represents the one child that died as a preteen from fever and the 11th child is not represented at all um but then the house is represented there's that blue ubiquitous blue house turned upside down with the um with the trees that are popping out of it to talk about that the the uh, permeability the permeable boundary between the interior and the exterior of my grandmother's home but this background is actually a composite of three different um, sourced images from online of a Vietnamese landscape. My dad did two. Wow. Tours. Yeah, my dad did two tours in Vietnam, and his brother was killed in 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 uh, the Vietnam War or conflict, but I, mm -hmm. it was a war. And um, and the figure on the right is a combination uh, person. It is both my aunt, the first woman in the military that I remember from my family, and um, and also me with my mm. hair that is very much not about the military, especially right when it was there. Sure. She's throwing, <laughs> she's throwing a, um, a fighter jet a, a, uh, that was used in Vietnam in the during the Vietnam War, um, and. It, um, and she's aiming it towards the background. And in this valley, I mean, you know, I always, I'm I'm one of those people that you should never ask about movies because I will tell you the whole <laughs> all the details. We love it. All the details. At least I do. <laughs> just just you know, don't don't ever ask me these things. Um, but in that background are co small collage sections of Levittown, Pennsylvania, right? And um, and black families were not allowed legally not allowed to live in Levittown. And so she's throwing this at them. And there are all sorts of other things that are happening in that, other kinds of references that are at play in this. You know, the figure, the pose of the body is from um, a series of Disney, um, Disney animations. Um, the, yeah, you know, uh, I, I, and I love that. The, the pop-up book is based on a classic pop-up book um, that you, that uh, kids would mm -hmm. get, um, you know, and I'm happy to share a bunch of all, of, you know, all of those references um, in an email, oh it was this fun, is... but, you know, one of the things that I always think about is that our, our stories are now nar narrated by what's already in the world, mm -hmm. and the new things that come up are because we're combining all those things, right? And so, and I love that. And so I'm just using the materials that are around me to tell the stories that are important to me or people that are around me. Um, and so that becomes exciting. So Disney becomes a language. 
right? Oh my gosh, that is, you just made my mind spin, you know, with, with, with so many of the ideas that are here, the, the thought of land, the thought of, I, I'm, I'm sure you've got this in, included in here, you know, the centuries of African Americans fighting for this land and then finding that you're locked out still, you're not a full citizen, um, mm -hmm. you know, but also your combination of the more vivid colors representing your family. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the more muted areas of this, I don't know if this is sculpture, painting, draw, I don't know, I don't know exactly how to classify this because it's just brilliant. It, it defines, well, thank you. It, you know, defies all those boundaries <laughs> in itself. Um, but yeah, this is one of those pieces that I was like, I could talk about this for, for you know, days on end. Um, there's just so much involved in it. It's gorgeous. I'd love to see this and, and, um, in real life up in clo close and personal. I We do have some questions. I love that folks are, are in the chat and in the Q&A with them. I'm gonna just slide over to the very last piece or, or sorry, this is the last one that yeah. you sent me. Um, yeah. And then we'll get to those questions. Sure, this is uh, this was made last year in the spring at the Brodsky Center, which is a uh, very well known and established um, print center that was um, founded by Judith Brodsky, um, a well known, a famous printmaker, um, uh, still living, um, mm -hmm. and um, and so many uh, amazing artists have worked through the Brodsky Center. Faith Ringgold has a series of prints. I mean, wow. anybody that you can think of has done something at the Brodsky. So um, I was invited by Paola Morciani, who is the uh, executive director, um, to create a print um, to work with a collaborative printmaker. And um, the interesting thing is that I started talking about this process or a watermark. And she immediately said, oh, we have a master paper maker. And, but that's the incorrect term, it's collaborative paper maker. Um, here and that um, uh, runs that um, that directs the paper making program, and that's Nicole Donnelly, who um, is the outgoing president of the I can't remember the title of it, of, but of the paper making society, um, mm -hmm. and um, and she's brilliant. Nicole is brilliant, and I I'm really excited that I get to work with her again. Um, but we worked on this for probably about 14 days. Wow. And there are four in this series. And we probably pulled about eight or nine of these handmade paper exper um, experiments. And, um, and we ended up with four in the edition. And the title of this piece is called Strolled Brugs, which is the name of a race of humans in um, Gulliver's Travels. And wow. they're the, they the, the humans that uh, are immortal and they stop aging when they turn around 80 and then they become wards of the state. They're decrepit. Oh my um, and so all of their, their material possessions, their land, et cetera, taken from them. Um, and they are left to the mercy of the people that are around them. But they're also annoying because they're old people. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but it's a really interesting thing because in my communities, elders are revered, mm -hmm. right? And not ignored. But I was also thinking about what it means to historically to be me, right? And to be um, a Black person in this country, to be um, of this country, to be... Um, a part of communities that built this country um, and then to also be invisible but mm. to be there to be both invisible and a part embedded in it and so I wanted to make pieces that were where the body was embedded in the thing that it was made of and actually only made of the thing so it's not a drawing it's not a so painting that, that is the paper it is the paper so oh. the body is a watermark the landscape is also paper, it's paper pulp, it is pigmented paper pulp. And so it's not paint or ink, there's no binder in it, it's just powdered pigment mixed with the pulp. And so it's a pulp painting. And you know, this is, you know, Nicole Donnelly is genius, 
right? And so she helped, um, she's the reason why I was able to realize this piece. Um, and it is, this figure is 65 inches tall in total. Oh my the oh my paper goodness. itself is about 90 inches tall. And, um, but, uh, but if you go from like heel to head of the, of one side of the body, she's my height. I'm five feet tall. Basically. Wow. This so is it's incredible. exciting to see this. I love this piece. Um, it's one of the newest pieces. And like I said, there's only four of them. And so uh, it's really wild to think about the kind of way that work gets made and the uniqueness mm -hmm. of it and the time and the labor and the effort, the collective effort of making work. And I think, you know, you had asked this question about how some of the work that I do in collectives and how it relates to my practice. And this is really this piece and the piece that we were talking about before, Permanent Change of Station, really is about that because it really does take, um, it has taken a, a collective or community effort to produce a lot of this work. And, um, and, and people are invested, not just in the process, but in the ideas. And so that's a really, that's an affirming gesture. Oh my gosh. And I, I love that you give credit to all those who are who are part of the process. Um, that, that's also really rare for an artist to do. And you, you're you just such a great job at talking about that. I was really curious about that piece. And now I'm like, I need to see one of those in well, person. You, you will be able to see it in person. So I have an upcoming solo exhibition at Tyler Park Presents. And it opens oh. up. 21st it actually opens up next week Is that next oh my week? goodness no First, way on the That's 21st amazing. so I'm excited about that and the show is called Ipsburg um which is uh is that considered a portmanteau or a combination no, it's not a portmanteau it's a combo word a made-up word that talks about self and um a kind of walled fortress or um a protected self and so I'm really excited so one of those of Strilbergs will be in it along with um, four other self-portraits. And so that wow. piece, Strollbrooks is a self-portrait and I actually don't make self-portraits. So uh, now I have five. And you it, can a, one time. That's yeah. amazing. And this is at Tyler Park Presents. Um, yes. are, are you, is, is that your new gallery or are you just doing a show with them right now? We're doing a show together right now. And so we'll see where all that leads. And I'm excited that's... to be working with Tyler and um, I'm just very excited about it. I'm excited to show this smaller, intimate body of work. Uh, Ty Tyler is here. Hey, uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, one of our, our really good friends, uh, Andrea Chung, works with them as well. So uh, <laughs> that's Andrea. awesome. Gotta love her. <laughs> My heart. Um, we, we are over time, but I need to ask these questions. I hope you Please. don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, is this Nico or Nieko um, asked in relation to your art practice, did you ever learn something while you were in art school, concept, theory, skill, forget that lesson in time, but then was reminded about that lesson from a student that uh, you had taught? If so, what was that lesson and how was it reintegrated into your practice? Oh my gosh, hi Nico, how are you? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, all the time, I, I have to, I had, um, I had an experience in grad school where I was just making, just making. I thought that that's all I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was having a great time doing it. And in my second semester, I had a professor say, you are not actually being a rigorous thinker. Like, oh no. <laughs> you know, and I tend to err on the side of direct too. So I, you know, I can, I took that criticism uh, very well. And, um, and I agreed. I think that a lot of times we, especially in schools, we think that just doing is the only thing that is important and, um, and necessary and is the only thing that we should value. But if that were the case, then we would not be in academic spaces learning about mm -hmm. art. And so one of the reasons why you study art within university systems or colleges or any other kind of formalized learning environment is to have an opportunity for deep thinking and reflection and study. 
And, um, and that is something that is at the cornerstone of how I teach. And so, yes, Nico, I'm reminded of that every time I work with someone. So, yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that. That's, that was a really great question. These, all the questions are amazing. Um, the last one that I have is from Veronica Jackson in reference to your comment about the white space around the body. Does the color of the space around the body matter? Meaning if presented with a deeply huge space like a black box, how or would you embrace it? I definitely would. So the funny thing is when I started making drawings, they were on toned sheets of vellum that mm. were black or blue or iridescent, et cetera. And uh, that was really exciting. And um, so all of my pages at one point, all of my drawings were tinted or colored in some way and the body emerged out of that. And it was in the early 2000s that I started working exclusively on this white ground. And so, yes, I would definitely embrace uh, when, when I moved back into colored grounds, um, I would definitely embrace that and colored spaces, you know, mm. because this idea of a body emerging or sitting within or embedded onto um, a space that is uh, that already comes with comes loaded with something uh, is is pretty exciting to me. I like that, you know. So yeah. Oh my gosh, that is amazing! Veronica. I love it. <laughs> um, I, I just want to leave you before we go. Um, you know, you mentioned the project that uh, Tyler Park presents. Are there any other projects that you want us to know about? Yeah, so I um, so I open up um, a solo show at, with Tyler Park Presents next week um, on the 21st. And then the week after that, on the 26th, um, I open another um, solo exhibition um, at Maryland Art Place here in Baltimore, Maryland. And that one is titled Smoky Hallow for mm -hmm. a Black community um, uh, a non-existent now Black community, long gone Black community called Smoky Hollow um, that was based in Tallahassee. And so that's pretty exciting. And then um, and then I am in the process with my uh, collaborators and collective with Kindred planning the spring and the summer uh, experiences that we're going to host. So yeah, that's what's oh, up. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. I also it's saw surprising. on your website that that you have a book that folks can also purchase. Yeah, yeah, definitely check it out. So the book is called Out of Place Artists Pedagogy and um, Artists Pedagogy and Purpose. And it is a co-edited book with uh, artist, a DC based artist named Tim Dowd, who teaches at American University. And it is uh, filled with essays from artists and artist educators and artist scholars from various backgrounds talking about their relationship to pedagogy and that, that relationship within their, their respective communities. And so 31 essays, um, probably a total of 46 artists, whether they're individual or they're working collectively. Yeah, and it's oh very gosh, that's... And it was produced, it was published um, with uh, through Punctum Books, um, which is uh, a project of passion for um, the founders of Punctum. And so what's really great about Punctum Books is that they are open access. And so you can go to Punctum and purchase the book, which would be very appreciated. You can purchase it through Amazon. You can also go to Punctum and download a PDF for free. Wow. Because part of their philosophy and their politic is that um, information is widely available to anybody that wants it. And um, that really did mirror the ethos of syndicate. I love that. I love that. Zoe, this has been such an incredibly enriching conversation. You are in so inspiring um, and I am moved and thank you for just one of the best conversations that we've ever had here. Thanks, this has been wonderful. That's been fun. Thanks. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. And right thank on. you every 
Thank you everyone who joined us so much. If you arrived late to the conversation, if you go to Moad's Facebook page, you will be able to go back and watch the entire conversation from the beginning. And by the end of this week, we'll also have this conversation on Moad's YouTube channel. Thank you so much everyone and have a wonderful, wonderful evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you, take care Zoe, this has been great. I really appreciate you. Thanks Dimitri. Okay, hope to see you soon. Bye, I'll see you next week. Yes, yes. <laughs>